Uh, just raise your hand and uh, somebody would uh, provide you. Okay, so there are some hands raised. Sangeet, uh, just keep your hands raised. Okay, right in the front here too. So in your Bibles, uh, please turn to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Uh, we have been studying uh, this letter uh, verse by verse. And today we are looking at three verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 to 18. Uh, incredibly practical in terms of application. Verse 16 be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Lord bless the reading of his holy word. So I have titled this sermon, The Three Imperatives for the Normal Christian Life. I'm using the word normal because this is God's expectation for us, day by day, week by week. So what are these three imperatives? Uh, this is uh, mandated upon us. Uh, here are three commands, if you like, which uh, all of us are called to keep. Uh, no one is exempt. They are all commands. The first one is rejoice evermore. Be joyful always. I would like to call that inexpressible joy. Inexpressible joy. Joy that cannot be described in words. Joy that cannot be expressed. Uh, joy that defies expression. Now, for your benefit, I have given you some uh, different translations of the same verse. So the message puts it this way, be cheerful no matter what. <laughs> I mean, what a command. When we lose a loved one, like what the Kasukurti family are going through right now, is it possible to obey this mandate? And the answer is yes. Be cheerful no matter what. Rejoice always. So in my Bible with a red pen, I have underlined the word always. Be full. So I have circled the word full. Be full of joy some of the time. Okay, good. You are following. Be full of joy all the time. Be happy in your faith all the time. It's always good to look at different translations. Uh, it gives you uh, a very uh, wonderful, uh, comprehensive idea of what the scripture means. So I want to break that command down into uh, five components. This joy that we are talking about, supernatural joy, the joy of the Lord. Uh, let's look at five components of it. So your first bullet, joy is the evidence of salvation. How do I know that I am right with God? How do I know that the Lord Jesus has come into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior? The answer is, I must be a person of joy. So, I've quoted for you 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Again, an incredible verse, 1 Peter 1 8. You believe in him, so that's salvation. You have trusted the Lord Jesus. You believe in him. And Peter is, Peter is saying to the church, You are filled, filled to overflowing. You are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. So the question I ask myself is Do I radiate joy? Do I personally, 24 hours of the day, do I radiate joy as evidence that the Lord has come to live in my life? That's a very probing, probing uh, truth that we all need to seriously consider. So joy is the evidence of salvation. Your second bullet, it is, uh, uh, by, by the way, before I go to the second bullet, uh, the book of Acts 
If you go through all the conversion experiences in the book of Acts, almost the first evidence is joy. So I want to show you three examples. So keep a finger at 1 Thessalonians 5 and turn to Acts chapter 2 and uh, the birth of the early church. Acts 2 and I'm reading verse 46 and I'm reading the last part of that scripture. Acts 2 46. They broke bread in their homes, the early church, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Glad and sincere hearts. They were filled with joy. Then if you uh, turn the page over to Acts chapter 8, let me show you two examples. I'm just only whetting your appetite so that you will read through the whole book of Acts and uh, look at all the other uh, examples. Acts 8 and look at verse 8. So Philip is sent to enemy territory, Samaria, and there he preaches the gospel and amazing things happen. Uh, there is deliverance, there is healing, people are repenting, they are turning to the Lord. Now look at the outcome. Acts 8, 8. So there was great joy in the city. Great joy because of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 8, 8. Then if you look at the Ethiopian eunuch, so the gospel is going to Africa now. It began in Jerusalem among the Jews and now it is penetrating to Africa through a very important government official, the finance minister of Ethiopia. So he has a conversion experience and look what it says about him. Acts 8 and verse 39. And if you look at the last part of the verse, but he, the Ethiopian eunuch, he went on his way rejoicing. He came to Jerusalem empty, devoid of joy, and the Lord comes into his life and he is filled with joy. So, are you filled with joy? Am I filled with joy? The second bullet, the second component of inexpressible joy, it is the expectation of God. God expects his people to be joyful. God doesn't expect his people to be grumpy and complaining and murmuring and griping and gossiping. No, no. God expects his people to be joyful. So Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always and just in case you didn't get it the first time, again I say to you, rejoice. Now when Paul wrote that, he wrote it from a prison the most unfavorable of all circumstances. So Paul is uh, teaching the church what he himself is experiencing. And so God's expectation is that we will always rejoice in the Lord. Not rejoice in circumstances because circumstances change. Not rejoice in people because people are going to let you down. Not rejoice in stuff because stuff can be taken away from you, but to rejoice in the Lord. And if I were to make it more specific, in my notes I have written two Ps, to rejoice in the person and the purposes of God. Will you please write that down? What are we called to rejoice in? The person and the purposes of God. I mean, there is little to rejoice about in the world today. We all agree on that. But if we focus our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> there is ample reason to rejoice. The glorious person of the Lord Jesus. And we can rejoice in the purposes of God. The purposes of God are always for our good and for God's glory. So we can rejoice in that. So joy is the evidence of salvation. It is the expectation of God. Now your third bullet. Joy is the expression of the Holy Spirit. So you know the verse well, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love and then joy. 
So how do I know that I'm spirit filled? That's a question that's often asked, isn't it? How do I know that the Holy Spirit has taken control of my life? He's governing my life. The answer is very simple. You don't have to look too far. You will be filled with joy. So it is an expression of the Holy Spirit who seeks to control our life. Now, uh, the fourth bullet, and I love this, the fourth bullet, joy is what helps us to endure in times of trial. Joy helps us to endure the hard times of life. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Here were people in captivity. They had very little to be joyful about. And yet they are being told that the joy of the Lord is their strength in the midst of all the bleak circumstances of life. Joy gives us strength, energy to face the challenges, to face the hardships and to keep moving forward. The endurance. And the fifth component of joy, very important in evangelism, essential for evangelism. If there is no joy in the person who's trying to present the gospel, better forget evangelism, right? I must be filled with joy if I'm going to make an impact upon the people who don't know the Lord. So John 15 and verse 11. And by the way, these verses were spoken on the eve of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind as I read this verse. John 15 and verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So when the Lord resides in our life and when the word of God resides in our life, the natural outcome has got to be joy. Complete means mature, mature joy, complete joy. It's not silly laughing. That's not what we are referring to. But a heart that is at peace with God, a heart that is right with God, a heart that knows God is actively at work in this world, no matter what. And in that, we take joy. So, uh, I like what one commentator said. I have written it for you in your notes. <laughs> we should pray for shining faces. Have you ever heard anyone pray like that at a prayer meeting? No. No one prays like that in a prayer meeting. So I'm going to encourage you to pray that. In your family prayer times, Oh God, as a family, please give us all shining faces. And then after that, you don't have to go and rub cosmetics on you. <laughs> because this joy is supernatural. This joy is supernatural. So the first uh, imperative is inexpressible joy. Now we come to the second imperative, incessant prayer. Incessant prayer. Pray continually. Short, crisp, clear commands. <laughs> uh, you know, even a child can understand this. You don't have to have a PhD to figure all this out, isn't it? So simple, so clear. So, Incessant prayer. Uh, Philip puts it this way, never stop praying. The message says pray all the time. Now, in order to pray incessantly, uh, I want to suggest to you uh, that there are three conditions that have got to be followed. And the first is very obvious. Confess all known sin. And I want you to write down Psalm 66, 18 by the side. I should have written it in your notes, but please write it. Psalm 66, 18. If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's what that verse says. If I cherish, if I harbor, if I love, if I entertain sin in my life, if I'm indulging in sin, I can pray, but nothing is going to happen. So I must keep short accounts with God and I must keep short accounts with people if my prayer is to be effective, right? 
confess all known sin. And you don't have to wait till the end of the day to do the confession, isn't it? When the Spirit of God convicts you, convicts me during the course of the day, we, uh, we, we name the sin, God, I got jealous, God, I lost it, I lost my cool, I lost my patience, God, I said a word I shouldn't have said, and uh, so we confess it. And we ask the Lord to graciously forgive us. But the second condition is we need to claim the promises of God. That's a very beautiful truth about prayer. We can claim the promises of God. So back in our homes in Asia, we love to take all the promises of God and we love to hang it on our walls. Can I get a witness? Yes. Right. I mean, it was a good witness for non-Christians when they came to visit us in our homes. They see all these scriptures on the wall. But the scriptures are not meant just to be put on a wall. They are meant to be taken and applied to daily life. Right? They are meant to be claimed. They are meant to be claimed. It's like God giving us a check, an incredible amount of money, all signed. But if I don't take it to the bank and cash it, that check is useless. That check is useless. So in the same way, the promises of God are meant to be claimed. So I'm just going to give you one. It's one of my favorite uh, promises for prayer. And you may want to write it down. John 14, verses 13 and 14. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Again, the words of the Lord Jesus on the eve of his crucifixion. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Again, very simple language. So what does praying in the name of the Lord Jesus mean? It simply means I pray uh, being consistent with the will of God. Is this what God wills? And if the answer is yes, you can claim it. So example, is it the will of the Lord that people should come to know him? Yes. So in your prayers, you can pray for the salvation of people, even the most stubborn heart that God can break through and uh, bring to himself. So beloved, in our prayer life, let's learn to keep claiming the promises of God, fulfill the conditions, and watch what God is going to do. Now, the third uh, suggestion I would like to make in terms of incessant prayer Converse with the Lord, converse, converse means talk to him, have an ongoing dialogue. I didn't say monologue, but dialogue, carefully chosen words. Monologue means one-way street, dialogue means two-way street. I'm speaking to the Lord and the Lord is speaking to me. And more and more now I have learned to be fine-tuned to the voice of the Lord. And the Lord has a lot of things to say to me. And the Lord has a lot of things to say to you. Right? So during the day, as you dialogue with the Lord, as you converse with the Lord, that is prayer. In fact, in my notes, I have written a little extra stuff. Converse with the Lord throughout the day over everything. Please write that down. Over every little insignificant detail of life. You can talk to the Lord about it. Lord, why the delay? Why this traffic jam? Lord, why did so and so ignore me this day? Lord, why is this day not turning out to be a good day? Lord, why is my job so boring? Lord, why do I have work colleagues who are equally boring? <laughs> right? You can talk to the Lord about it and the Lord is not going to get shocked by it. So let's. Uh, so I, I love the words of the the very familiar hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus! I love that one liner. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Very simple advice. So somebody comes and shares a problem with you. You know what you do? Let's go and tell the pastor. No, <laughs> pastor is useless. I mean, eliminate the pastor. Take it to the Lord. In prayer, just wrap your arms around that person and say, 
can the two of us pray over, over the problem you have mentioned? <laughs> you, need, you don't need a pastor in the equation, right? And uh, Philippians 4, 6, the passage we read earlier, in everything by prayer. In nothing be anxious. Don't let anything worry you. Sometimes I get very worried about the increasing number of gray hairs on my head. I'm human. I'm human. And then I remember, take that also to the Lord in prayer. And you know, I did that and uh, jokes apart, uh, when I went to our Mississauga church, a uh, guy came and gave me a, a bottle. He said, Pastor, you put this on your head, your hair will grow. <laughs> so if my hair grows, I'll give you the name, Brother Babuji. Okay, if it works for you also, we'll give it to the church at a price. And we share the rewards. Right. Okay, so we can have fun. Okay. Incessant prayer. Bombard heaven with your prayers. Okay. Now, the third command. The third command in verse 18 is more lengthy. Giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So again, the question is asked, what is God's will? Again, very simple answer. It is God's will that you be thankful in all circumstances of life. That is God's will. So I want to call that irresistible thanks. I mean, irresistible thanks means I cannot help but give thanks to God. I mean, today when I heard the birds chirping, I just had to stand and join in the chorus of the bird song. Beautiful, right? So please train your ears to hear the sounds of nature. And they will give you a wonderful opportunity to give thanks to God for. I saw the blue skies and I said, oh, wow, beautiful Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, right? So again, uh, two different uh, translations. Whatever happens, I want you to underline the next three words. Keep thanking God. What a challenge. So your resources are running low. Your income is low. What do you do? Keep thanking God. Your parents are yelling at you. Keep thanking God. Now I know that doesn't apply to anyone here at New Life. We are a cut above the rest. Because we have received new life. Right, Brother Don? We have received new life. So, keep thanking God. No matter what. And uh, the message says, thank God no matter what happens. So, when your team loses and loses badly, keep thanking God. Say, Lord, we deserve that spanking. Won't say anything more. Uh, this is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. Now, your first bullet to help you, because this is a very general command, to help you, I'm going to give you 26 reasons why you and I should be thankful to God. So write the word reasons. And I'm just going to read the list. And I'm going to encourage you to take this list, break it down into components of five, and on a daily basis, just go through the list and practice thanking the Lord. Beloved, more and more we should be a thankful people. Lord, I am thankful. It should be evident in our conversation. It should be evident in our prayer life that we are thankful to the Lord. So let me walk you through this list. I have actually numbered it in red in my notes. When you go home, you can number it yourself, but there are 26. Why am I thankful? Because God is sovereign. Hey, God is ruling. God is on the throne, not Satan. Not Satan. God is on the throne. God causes all things to work together for good of his children. All things together, not taken separately. All things together. So my mom used to bake delicious cakes. But the part I loved about uh, cakes is uh, going and buying all the ingredients. So you buy the ingredients and if you try to eat the ingredient by itself, some of those ingredients are very bitter. 
You can't touch it. You can't put it in your mouth. But when you take all those ingredients and you blend it together and you put it into the oven, out comes a delicious cake. So don't look at life on the individual strands of life. Look at life from the big picture. Look at life from the big picture. And you will soon discover that God is actively at work doing something in your life and my life. And so for that we give thanks to God. Hard times reveal our weaknesses. It breaks our pride and it shows us our total need for the Lord. So we are thankful for that. We are thankful for that. Like uh, the person who called me, I shared this somewhere. I forget where. Oh, our cell group. The person called me uh, and he was having a tough time with his wife and he narrated all the stuff that was happening. And you know how he ended the conversation? He said, I thank the Lord that he is using my wife to break me. And I said, a loud amen, nothing more needed to be said, phone was kept down. Isn't that beautiful? At least one person is laughing. Did you know that God can use your wife to break you? God can use your husband to break you? God can use your children to break you? I know you are not responding. So change the subject you are saying. Number four. God has triumphed over sin and death through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are profoundly thankful for the empty tomb. So yesterday at Johnson's home, that's what we did. We recollected hope scriptures, read them from memory, spoke it out. We sang, uh, because he lives. And we prayed a prayer that reflected the empty tomb. We don't get recycled, right? Right? So I went for my annual physical to my uh, doctor who <laughs> uh, I'm still trying to figure him out, elderly gentleman. And he suddenly looked at me and he said, so there is life after death. I said, yes. So we come back. I said, no. I said, no. He said, no, we come back. Yeah, I know what you are referring to, uh, reincarnation, uh, to be recycled. I'm not expecting to be recycled. I'm not expecting doc to come back as a dog. One life. One death, judgment, and God is going to give us a resurrection body. You don't have to go through 84,000 different uh, cycles of reincarnation at the low end of the spectrum. Imagine coming back as a worm and being eaten by a fish and the fish being grilled. If you really believe that uh, teaching. So I had a good dialogue with the doctor. And uh, then he uh, looked at me and he said, oh, that guy Paul. I said, yeah. He said, we have Ramit Paul at church. He said, no, no, not that Paul, the Paul in uh, Acts, uh, he didn't say Acts, in the Bible. So I said, okay, what about Paul? Oh, he had hallucination, yeah, but uh, if he had hallucination, it has got to be an amazing hallucination because his whole life changed and God used him to take the gospel to the whole world and Christianity is what it is today because of Paul. That's hallucination, doc? Oh, let's meet together and talk. Yes, at your expense at Lynn Garden. Got to seize the opportunity. Pshh. So I, I go expecting something to happen, whether it's the doctor or whoever, right? To share the gospel. Anyway, that's, that's just a side, uh, uh, sidebar. God uses the worst that happens to promote our spiritual growth. Beloved, we need to be thankful for adversity, because much of the growth in our life spiritually happens because of adversity, not because of prosperity. It's the hard times that cause growth in our life. It's the hard time that causes us to open the Bible and start reading. It's the hard times that drive us to our knees. It's the hard time that causes us to come to church more regularly, to seek the face of God, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and to experience that God will add all the other things to us. Hard times, right? We are thankful for that. God keeps his promises. We thank him for that. Perfect track record of keeping his promises, our God. Evil will not reign forever. 
Yeah, today evil seems to be winning in many parts of the world. Hey, but evil doesn't have the final say. The Lord Jesus Christ has the final say. One day he's going to return and one day there is going to be established righteousness here on earth. He's going to rule for a thousand years. A new heavens and a new earth. Evil will be totally dismantled, totally destroyed. Heaven is our eternal home. So we thank the Lord for our eternal home. Right? Our eternal home. Beloved, the older we grow, the more we should be longing for our eternal home. I met a guy on Friday afternoon in the prison. Young fellow, two small children. He's telling me the story. Three years and four years. He said, uh, the problem I'm facing now is I'm building a house in uh, Oshawa, ground up. Meaning he has got a contractor and he's building this mansion. And he told me all the figures, everything. And the guy is in prison. You know, uh, the sad thing is, that's how the culture around us is living. Make more money, make more money, get a second job, get a third job, get a fourth job, uh, buy the palace, buy the latest car, this, that, that. We have totally forgotten our eternal home. So my favorite admonition to you is live with an open hand. Live with an open hand. And be ready at a moment's notice to depart to our eternal home. Live light, live loose in the sense of having a loose hold of things. You know, the more possessions we have, the greater they control us the greater they control us. So that has got to, the lure of riches, I was reading the parable of the sow and it hit me between the eyes as I read those words, the lure of riches, just a little more, just a little more, just a little more, just a little more. No contentment in life with what God has blessed us with. More, more, more. And we have forgotten our eternal homes. You know, all the songs about heaven, for the most part, come from the Negro spirituals. Why from the Negro spirituals? Because they went through hardship, terrible hardship. And they were always looking toward their eternal home. And they pen for us some of the most magnificent hymns on heaven. <laughs> How many uh, songs about heaven do we have from the contemporary uh, songs? Hardly any. Hardly any. So, we, we, we uh, thank the Lord that his grace is sufficient for every situation. I've intentionally put is in uppercase letters. God's grace is sufficient for whatever we are called to go through in life and we can be thankful to the Lord for that. God's grace. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> and Paul uh, lists about 17 wild horses in that passage. If, if at all possible, here are 17 things that could try to separate you from the love of Christ. It won't. It can't. You read the passage for yourself, Romans 10, Romans 9. And then... Uh, there is no pit, uh, okay, uh, yes, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. You know who first coined those words? Corrie ten Boom, as she suffered in a Nazi concentration camp, having seen every member of her family killed. These are priceless words, folks. These were not written from a hotel. This particular statement, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still, came from the hell of Auschwitz. There are no impossibilities with God. <laughs> so we can thank him. There is no impossible person. There is no impossible situation that God cannot remedy. So we are thankful. Our God is the God of the impossible. God is a very present help in time of trouble. Again, I've intentionally put a very present help in bold letters. He has helped us in the past. He will help us in the future. But right now, for what you are going through, he's a very present help. So we thank him. 
Our Father will not test us beyond what we can bear. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. So you think your problems are huge, unbearable? God knows. He knows your load limit. He knows my load limit. He knows my load limit. So he will not permit anything to come into our life which we are unable to bear. The Holy Spirit abides with us always. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and went, came and went, came and went. But now he permanently indwells us. That's why we can have fire in our heart. Because one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit is fire, the fire of enthusiasm. Right? Enthusiasm for the Lord, enthusiasm for his work. Right? Not a hit and uh, run kind of a Christianity. No. The Holy Spirit abides with us always. The Lord Jesus feels our pain. Right? He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He is not a distant, aloof, remote God. He entered into the human predicament. He went through every conceivable human experience that you and I are called to go through in life. And he was victorious. He is our model. He is our example. He is our elder brother. He is our Anna. So we thank him. We thank him because he feels our pain. The Holy Spirit prays for us when we are too weak to pray for ourselves. Have you been there? You don't know what to say, what words to utter. You know, you're, you're down and out, uh, you're worn out, and the Spirit of God comes to our aid. He energizes us and he begins to uh, declare words which uh, you sometimes wonder, where did that come from? So we are thankful to the Holy Spirit for being our prayer partner. <laughs> for being our prayer partner. And uh, then we thank the Lord that God uses everything and wastes nothing. You know, in the twin stories of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, when all the eating was done, what did the Lord say? Collect what remains. God entertains no wastage. So we are thankful to the Lord that he uses everything, every circumstance of life, every pain is used by God to our advantage. You know, the, the greatest tragedy of life, at the end of life, is a wasted life. A wasted life. And so, beloved, uh, from time to time, God gives us a wake-up call. And we suddenly discover the ladder that we have placed and which we are climbing, hoping to reach the top, is leaning on the wrong, against the wrong wall. And God, in his mercy, gives us opportunity to make course corrections. Isn't it? So, beloved, every day that passes by, you should be able to say, with the help of God, today was a productive day. I live for the Lord. I invested for the Lord. Souls were touched. Souls were blessed. It's not at the end of the day counting to see how much of dollars I have made. That's not it. That's what the world does. Isn't it? For us, it should be a productive day. And, you know, honestly, every night, I have an amazing uh, Thanksgiving time. I just look back on the day and I just keep thanking the Lord for everything that happened, the little details, the little details, how it all happens. I took my car for rust proofing and, uh, and the guy uh, looked at me and said, I, noticed, I, I, I know you're a, ho you're, you're a religious guy. He didn't use the word holy. You're, you're a religious guy. I said, how do you know that? Oh, I saw a, a, a religious book in your car. Uh, that sparked off a whole conversation about the Lord. And he looked at me and said, Oh, daily brother, there was a time I read it. And I grabbed the copy and I put it into his hand. And I said, Sir, please read it. And he said, Yes, I'm realizing. You know, I've done this job for 40 years. I'm now suddenly realizing. Is my ladder leaning against the wrong wall? What a timely visit. And of all the guys who could have been there to attend to me, he happened to be there. And so next time around, I'm going to take more devotional literature to give to him. Trying to take more souls to heaven. That's our main purpose here in life, isn't it? To take more souls to heaven by the way we live and what we say, our prayers. And so we thank the Lord for those opportunities he provides every day. 
And uh, we thank the Lord because someday we, we will be fully conformed to the image of Christ. We are in process. We are not there yet. Right? Every day we should be reflecting the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that is going to be perfected only in heaven. And we thank him for that. And then uh, we thank the Lord because he is faithful to finish what he begins. The God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Completion, Philippians 1 6. So don't despair, don't lose heart. Sometimes it may be like two steps forward and ten steps back. I felt that way at times. But God is at work. He, he isn't finished with you yet. So thank Him. Keep thanking Him. And keep praying, God be active in my life. Lord Jesus, be active in my life. Move me forward, Lord Jesus. Move me forward, Lord Jesus. Our hardships. Equip us to minister to others. Wow. It's not the seminary that equips you for ministry, beloved. It is the challengers of life. The challengers of life. The hardships which you went through and you won by the power of God. That's what you use to minister to people. And we can thank the Lord for that. Telling your story. Telling your story and encouraging someone. God's plan far exceeds our puny imagination. Aren't you thankful to God for that? That he has an absolutely amazing plan for you and for me. Which is executed here on earth but it is brought to total full completion in heaven. And then... Uh, Another great verse from Psalm 30, weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning and we are thankful to the Lord for that. Some of our trials last for days, for weeks, for months, and it could possibly even last for years. So weeping may endure for a night taken in context is not just a 24 hour time period. But through all that pain and hardship over the years, God is working so that one day when you see the sun shine in all its glory, you are going to say, wow, all that pain was well worth it for this beautiful, beautiful sunlit day for which God is preparing you and for which God is preparing me. Thank him, thank him in the deepest darkness when the lights go out in your life, because the sunshine will be all the more glorious, grander, greater. Thank him. And uh, then we are still God's children, even when our faith falters. And we all have our <laughs> uh, faith faltering days, but we are still the people of God. Dear Father, you are still my father. I am your child. My faith is at a low ebb, but you haven't given up on me. You haven't disowned me. You haven't kicked me out of your family. I belong to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. While we suffer outwardly, we are being renewed inwardly. What a paradox. What a paradox. So, outwardly, we are wearing away. Right? The body is getting old. <laughs> like one day I went to my, a clinic and a, a lady doctor came to treat me. And the first thing she said without even figuring out what my problem was, she said, as we age, all our organs are beginning to die out. I should have said thank you and left. But uh, uh, I mean, you don't expect a doctor to say that. But that's what she said. Right? But she was true. Right on. Bang on. Right? Yeah, physically we are all wearing away. With the, with the best of medical uh, technology, they can only just extend life. But inwardly, inwardly, in the inner man, something wonderful, glorious, deep is happening. Is something profoundly deep happening in your inner person? That's the question to ask. That's the question to ask. And we thank the Lord for that. And... Uh, uh, what a way to finish this list of 26. Our light <laughs> and momentary troubles. Circle those two words, light and momentary. And you know who's writing this? Paul. And he gave to us a catalog of the sufferings that he has gone through. And we look at Paul and say, Paul, you've got to be kidding. 
you look at that catalog of suffering and you're calling it light and momentary. But then keep reading. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. So what Paul is trying to say is cultivate the eternal perspective. All the troubles we have now will fade into in comparison when we think of the eternal glory that God has in store for us. So beloved, I want you to go through this list. Take it slow, take it slow. Think through each word, think through each line. Write your notes, write your notes. Like yesterday, uh, I was teaching a Bible study class in the evening and one of the dear younger ladies, I just gave a few suggestions and man, she comes with a huge Bible, a huge journal and I said, wow, you're growing, you're growing, you're bringing your own Bible, you're bringing your highlighter, a small child, profuse notes that she is writing, 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 growth. And that's what, as a pastor, I love to see. I look for that. I love to see that. And I say, thank you, Lord, for this dear lady <laughs> making enormous uh, uh, progress. So take your journal and write and write your own prayers, write your own thoughts and, uh, and grow, grow, grow in light of all what God sends into our life. Right. So reasons, and as we wrap it all up, the results. The results. If we are a thankful people, if we keep thanking the Lord, here are three profound results. Right? Now watch it carefully. The first one is, God's presence is manifested. God's presence is powerfully manifested when you start thanking the Lord. When you start grumbling, griping, complaining, Satan's power and presence is brought to the fore. The choice is ours. If I am thankful to the Lord, I am bringing in the presence of the Lord. Satan loves to feed on garbage. Church, are you listening? So if I am grumbling and griping, I am inviting Satan to come to the garbage dump. And that's why people become irritable, you know, you look at their face, there's no joy, you know, and you know, something is happening, something is wrong here, right? So if you are thankful, God's presence is going to be powerfully made visible in you and around you. If you are thankful, God's power is released. You know the context under which the twin miracles happen, uh, feeding of the 5,000 and feeding of the 4,000? It's emphatically stated after the Lord gave thanks. Don't miss that. If you miss that, you miss the miracle. After the Lord gave thanks, the multiplication began to take place. So when is God's power released in your life and my life and in the life of the church? When we are corporately thankful to the Lord. And then, when we are thankful, God's peace becomes our guard. That's Philippians 4. God's peace is going to be like a soldier on duty, walking around our mind and heart and keeping off all intruding negative thoughts. But it happens in the context of thanksgiving and prayer. If I thank the Lord and if I am praying, God's peace takes active duty to guard my mind from becoming negative right three priceless gifts that god gives us in the context of being a thankful people so what's going to be our response your final r what's going to be your response i want to suggest three thank him often <laughs> thank him often throughout the day Find opportunity, occasion to say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And name the reason as to why you are thankful. Right? Thank him often. Thank him openly. Public. Be public about your thanksgiving. Be vocal about your thanksgiving. Parents, 
You want your children to grow in the Lord? More and more, they have to hear expressions of thanksgiving to the Lord coming from your lips, from my lips. If they don't hear it from our lips, I mean, coming to Sunday school is not going to help them grow. So be public and be vocal in your thanksgiving to God. And I've uh, intentionally used the third O word, thank him optimistically. Nice big juicy word, tongue twisting word, right? Thank him optimistically. What does that mean? That something positive is going to happen. Because I have chosen to say thank you to the Lord, something positive is going to happen. Right? Try it and see. If it doesn't work, let me know. I'll take that third part off the notes. So we are going to pray. And uh, we now we're going to sing a song too? Okay. So let's pray and ask the Lord to give us grace to obey these three mandates. Lord, we uh, thank you for these three crisp commands. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give us day by day to obey them. Forgive us for the times where we have been prayerless, joyless, thankless. Forgive us. Have mercy upon us. And may today be the beginning of a new day, a new era, a new start in each one of our lives. That we will always be joyful, always be thankful, and our hearts be on its knees 24-7-365. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.